Hi, I'm Kevin from the Catholic Education Office, Ballarat, and I'd like to welcome you to this short course on computational thinking. During this video, we're going to get an understanding of what computational thinking is and why it's important for students to understand it. And then we're going to look at some opportunities for using it in the classroom. Computational thinking is one of the three identified skills within the Australian curriculum and part of the technologies framework within the Victorian curriculum. According to the VCAA in Digital Technologies, students use computational thinking and information systems to analyse, design and develop digital solutions. To be honest, this statement undersells computational thinking and its place within the curriculum because we've been using it well before computers existed and you don't actually need a computer to undertake computational thinking. So let's explore this a little further. Computational thinking is a structured process of analysis, understanding and creating solutions to problems. This structured approach aligns with computational or computer-based thinking as machines need a logical set of instructions which we will refer to as an algorithm that can be rinsed and repeated with great speed and precision. An example of this is a computer perfectly mapping a path through a maze in the blink of an eye that makes us poor old humans look slow and foolish by comparison. Computational thinking is a linear four-step process, so let's go through each one of these to better understand them. Step one, decomposition. Decomposition is the process of breaking a problem into its parts. We do this to both simplify and reorganize things into logical elements we better understand. When we deconstruct something, we get a far better appreciation of its complexity of the challenge and understand the key components and what systems may have to stay together for a purpose. For example, doctors decompose symptoms and data to determine illness and cures. Mechanics disassemble engines into systems to isolate an issue. Mathematicians divide complex equations using BODMAS to find a solution. A young reader deconstructs complex unknown words using chunking as a strategy. Step 2. Pattern recognition. During pattern recognition, we first look for similarity and fit internally among the decomposed elements by applying labels such as size, shape, stakeholders, blockers, and enablers. Next, we look externally to ask ourselves if we've seen something similar to this before, maybe leading to a need for some research to see if a solution already exists and what we can learn from the success and failure of others. For example, an epidemiologist identifies clusters of illness for further research. A mechanic follows a course of action based on prior knowledge of a specific maker vehicle. A mathematician uses patterns within multiplication and division to cross-check. A student uses O-U-G-H as a spelling pattern to attempt spelling unknown words. Step 3. Abstraction. Abstraction is by far the most abstract concept to anyone undertaking first-time computational thinking, but rest assured it's very simple. Think of abstraction for what it is a synonym for subtraction because it is here we are asking ourselves how can we make this problem simpler? What might we take away or remove that is getting in the way of solving our root problem? It is at this point you might identify you are trying to solve multiple issues simultaneously that could be far easier dealt with independently. You prioritise what stays, what goes, possibly even reappraising your original problem and identifying others to deal with later. In essence, abstraction is all about removing complexity, filtering and possibly even ignoring some elements to better focus on what matters most. For example, a triage nurse abstracts patient knee pain complaint to focus on chest pain and shallow breathing. A mechanic removes components and tests it in another vehicle for analysis. A student quickly draws an animal with a fat belly, curly tail, stubby nose to represent a pig. A teacher ignores the details from the boy who cried wolf to focus on the unstated message. Step 4. Algorithmic design. So by now you have a better understanding of the actual problem, its elements, and now it's time to design a solution. It's time to think like a computer with efficiency and effectiveness as your driver. Your instructions must be written in a manner so simple and effective anyone could follow them like a recipe to bake a cake. Your algorithm must be replicable by others. If applicable, you might even create a computer code automating the problem out of existence. For example, a doctor writes an algorithm of medication and exercise to treat an illness. A mechanic draws a flowchart of the most efficient way to change a set of spark plugs. 
A mathematician creates an algorithm on a spreadsheet which visualises data to share with others. A student programs a robot to move in a perfect circle using a visual coding language. Step 5. Debugging. I haven't mentioned this until now as some definitions of computational thinking don't include it whilst others do. The debugging phase is all about testing your solution and refining your algorithm for efficiency and effectiveness. It's that simple. So when should I use computational thinking? Computational thinking is at its most useful for dealing with problems in which there is a need for a solution and it's vital to moving forwards. If you are looking to do something more efficiently or effectively, then it's a great fit. Computational thinking lends itself to data-driven problems. This can include categorical data like colours, shapes, parts, and numerical data such as weights, time, and measures. For instance, how can we speed up morning peak hour traffic? Or how can we identify and isolate sick people in a pandemic? These are great computational thinking questions. Where it can fall short is as a useful tool when the issue is strongly associated with people's emotions and opinions. For instance, it's far more practical if every one of us drove the exact same car with interchangeable parts. But that's not how we're wired. We have different wants and needs, and that's how it should be. There are other problem-solving methods such as systems thinking which is far more inclusive of these needs and emotions and we can explore how we can use these within computational thinking also. So why is computational thinking useful to students? The world is growing increasingly dependent on algorithms, be it your recommended watch list on Netflix, your Facebook adverts or your coffee machine making an instant cappuccino. Students need to understand the elements leading to the creation of these algorithms to appreciate it's not technical magic or wizardry, it's mathematics, logic and science in action. It's incredibly efficient, powerful and can provide clear solutions to real problems. Algorithms are computational thinking in action and increasingly they are having a growing influence upon us and the way we operate as a society. They are fueling the information era gold rush and we need to better understand and inform students about this process both as consumers and creators. Computational thinking has no boundaries on age or ability and can be applied to any area of the curriculum. In the next module we'll demonstrate how you can use this in the classroom. So I hope that provides a deeper understanding of what computational thinking is and next we're going to have a look at how you can use it in the classroom.